I was about four years old and my dad kind of pulls this big square thing from behind his back. And he says, do you know what this is? And, you know, this is a, a band, they're called Iron Maiden. That was Iron Maiden made in Japan. And that was like really my first <laughs> introduction <laughs> into, into music. You know? Hi, I'm Jamie Hernandez, and this is The Ins and Outs with Mackie, a show about awesome gear and awesome people. We'll be bringing musicians, engineers, podcasters, streamers, and sometimes the occasion of Macoid. If you're new to the show, make sure to hit that subscribe button on your favorite platform to get all the latest Mackie updates as soon as they are out. And be sure to check in the description on how you can be entered to win a free microphone. So our guest today is a world-renowned drummer, ambitions and visionary writer, composer, producer, engineer, and teacher with a reputation for being one of the hardest working in the business. He has built a brand name through co-founding and developing rock bands Dillinger Escape Plan and Coheed and Cambria and launching them into legendary status. Since 2009, he has continued his musical journey and is now working on multiple commercial and film projects as well as working as a post-audio engineer for Turner Network's Courageous Studios. Welcome to the show, Chris Penny. Hello, Jamie. <laughs> so Chris, tell me your earliest musical memory. My earliest musical memory would be probably when I was four years old and MTV was like a big thing then. And my parents, they were big fans of music. They went to a lot of concerts. They went and saw like Led Zeppelin and, oh man, all sorts of bands. But I was about four years old and I, I'll never forget it. I was sitting down uh, on my couch in the living room and my dad come home, you know, he came home from work and he kind of pulls this big square thing from behind, you know, his back. And he says, do you know what this is? And it's like, I have no clue what this is. And um, he just kind of says to me, he says, you know, this is a, a band, they're called Iron Maiden. And I really want you to listen to them. And that was, I believe it was Iron Maiden Made in Japan, um, which was like an EP record. Yeah, so I was like four years old. And that was like really my first <laughs> introduction <laughs> into, into music, you know. And so, yeah, my parents were, um, they were really into like a lot of different styles of music. A lot of, a lot of the stereo was like always going. Yeah. So I saw that you also went to the Berkeley College of Music. Let's let's talk about that. Well, it it, it helped, you know, further my education. Uh, I think just in music in general, you know, and um, and what I was interested in was not necessarily just playing drums. I wanted to be, you know, just kind of well rounded. And I, and at the time before I left to go to uh, to Berkeley, I'd say like in my junior and senior year of high school uh, is when I started to get, I really started to get into, um, I'd say like synthesis and music technology at the time. One of the classes I took, um, we were working with on, I don't, I can't even remember, like it was like, oh God, it was like a Mac Perform, a super ancient computer. And the teacher said to us, he said, um, I'm trying to remember exactly how he said it. He said, hey, guys, you're going to love this. This like this new breakthrough in the program that they have here. It's it's called Opcode Vision. And um, you're going to be allowed to record like one track of audio on the computer program. And we were just like, the novelty <laughs> of that was like insane, you know. And so, um, you know, now looking at what it's become, it's it's totally crazy how it's, you know, it's just exploded, and, and, and really what happened is I went there for two years and uh, certain personal events and, and I think certain things just started to take shape, basically, that that really forced me in a way, um, not reluctantly, but just it just put me into this place to where I started performing with bands and kids that were going to Berkeley. And then I still had, you know, the guys that I were, you know, I was playing with at home. And so that kind of led me to kind of kind of leave there after two years. And I had two bands, you know, where I was basically 
performing back home with the guys and the bands, which eventually became Dillinger and another band that was up there that I still stayed in touch with and played with. And, and this was a band called Boxer, which was like kind of like a punk rock band that um, eventually, you know, was able to get like a label deal and, you know, those types of things that, that sort of happened um, that just kind of led me on basically a 15 year journey <laughs> <laughs> of, you know, um, kind of living out like my, my dreams, basically. That's, that's basically what it was. I, I didn't expect it. I wasn't, you know, expecting anything to happen. I just kind of went with it and, and it just one thing just kind of led to another. Well, you've collaborated with some really notable artists and have grown with them and have really expanded your career in ways a lot of other artists don't. How did you first go about creating a powerful network? Let's start there. Well, it's interesting. Um, I think a lot of the network kind of comes from, I think, two, two major things. And some of that, the network was just built from the bands, you know, being in, in, in the bands. And then Billinger really kind of had um, such a, a, I'd say like a, a very loyal, very uh, rabid, you know, following. Um, one of the things at the time that was interesting is that we didn't wholeheartedly uh, try to like make the sale or like sell ourselves out to it. But we were lucky, I think, through kind of what we were doing that people were kind of by word of mouth coming, you know, to stuff, uh, coming to shows and, and paying attention. And so it just kind of grew from there. And, you know, I think we had a good enough product and there was, you know, the individuals that made up the whole on every level were very strong. And so, you know, other opportunities would come along to where like, you know, it would be like, can you, do you want to play drums on my record or, you know, um, how else can we figure out, you know, ways to, I don't know, like, you know, do things that still like involve doing music, which we love so much, you know, teaching or doing clinics or yeah, it just, you know, personally, and as a band, those things were just kind of feeding one another. And then, um, you know, when I left the band and then got into Kohi, there was another different level of that. And then, uh, you know, after Coheed, when I started getting more into production and what I went to school for initially, um, it's interesting. I mean, like some of the gigs that I got scoring commercials came from people who were like fans of the band. And then they were just kind of like, Hey, I just, you know, I, I, you know, I work at this like agency now and we're doing like this Ford commercial. You want to like try your hand at doing this, you know, to me, yeah, the, the network has always just kind of come from, you know, the people that were kind of like involved all the way back, like from the beginning. And as they grew and as we grew, um, those connections and those friendships that were made along the way and continue to you know, uh, to keep in touch with, they always kind of reciprocate ar around, you know, like, um, and, and hopefully, you know, at, at this point in the, you know, of, of my career of what I've done, hopefully I've done like a, a good enough job. And I, I think so, because I seem to get, you know, the calls coming back and I could either be from like, you know, uh, locally from, you know, um, people that I, I track with or, you know, track for uh, people that I write with or, you know, commercials that I do. It, it's, you know, I've, I've, I think the, the, the proof that you're, you know, working uh, in sync with people personally and, and doing a good job with the, the products that you're giving, you know, and working and collaborating with the people on, um, you know, when they come back and they keep asking you, that's, that's a great feeling. In an earlier interview, you talk a lot about the importance of being prepared and being able to adapt easily. And I love that because that just really speaks to your whole career where, you know, like you said, you found all these windows of opportunities and you, you went for it, you know, because you saw a bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. Do you, 
do you, <clears throat> this is a different world we're living in, you know, uh, uh, yeah. some, some people are, are working from home and creating from home and we have creators listening, <laughs> you know, right now to this interview. Yeah. What are, what are ways that creators now can establish their own opportunities to stand out and create a network that could hopefully, you know, open up windows of opportunities like, like you saw yourself. Yeah. I think, you know, the big thing now, obviously, and it's been, you know, for a while now is that everybody has access to the tools, you know, uh, before it was like in the hands of a, a certain few. Um, the thing that I love so much about what I do now is um, you do something kind of different like every week. So like, for instance, like um, there was a point where I was writing for like a, like a, uh, like a media conglomerate called layer TV. And, you know, we were getting gigs like every week, which it would be like, you know, I don't know, it's like something for Bentley or something for UPS or something for whatever. And, and the director, there was different directors on each one. And they would just kind of be like, you know, this week we want like, uh, I don't know, like a, you know, like a, an electro like vibe, like for, you know, this song and we want Star Wars next week for this certain thing, or we want like an indie vibe for this. And so being thrown different things like every week, like really like expanded the chops um, and, you know, artistically taking things out of the comfort zone of just being like, you know, well, we're going to write a rock record and it's going to be like a different version of that, but it's still going to be a rock record, you know, and, and that's great because you got to try and challenge yourself and beat that. But, you know, I think just one of the perks was really trying to take something, you know, that there was like really kind of like, I don't know, so far out in left field and try to make that possible and make it work. And then, you know, I, I guess succeeding, you know, and sometimes <laughs> failing miserably, but like learning from it and, and then, you know, moving on to the next thing. Yeah. So like, I, I really try my best to like be as prepared as I can, but also at the same time, sometimes you just can't be prepared for things and you got to just kind of figure it out by being thrown to the fire and just go for it, you know? Um, and I think the, the past, I think the past 10 years has been that more than anything. It's just, there are different subcategories or certain things that have just kind of come along and, you know, more times than yes, uh, more times than, you know, than, than, uh, I think I said, no, I, I just said like, let me try this. Let me, let me see what happens, you know? And, and if I fail, like I fail and, you know, it, and if I do, like, I just, I want to know what it is that like I failed at. And, um, you know, to me, like, I just, I really enjoy that process. I really do, you know, and, and now like, I'm just in, in a, another process of moving on to, you know, trying to learn things like, like CG and stuff like that, you know, and just, I just want to keep learning, you know? So can we talk a little bit more about this film stuff that you're working on? Like you said, you've extended your talents to television, film scoring with uh, Fight Mannequins, yeah. and Turner Network's Courageous Studios. Can you tell us a little bit more about each of those projects? Yeah, so so Fight Mannequins was uh, the production company that I started okay. with my friend, friend Brett, but that was back in 2009 because I think we were both kind of in the same place. You know, he had a band... And how I met him basically is that I sat in on a session um, that he was, I think their drummer, he had like broke his back or something like that. But long story short, I sat in on a session for him. We, you know, immediately had a great friendship and we were both kind of in the same place around that time in 2009. And, and we wanted to try our hand at, at like the production side because we had both been playing for, you know, a good 15 to 20 years you know, like in and around touring for him, it was more like on a local level uh, for me, you know, it was like international level, but we were both kind of in the same place and um, you know, we're around in and around the same age bracket. So we just decided to, you know, 
let's just buy all this gear and see what happens and, you know, be ambitious. And, you know, our influences were starting to turn more towards soundtracks and we were, you know, getting into things like, um, you know, like, uh, like, like Hans, some of Hans Zimmer's soundtracks at the time that he did with Christopher Nolan. And uh, I was really big into classical music at that time. I had like, you know, um, a really big, um fascination with with classical music and um you know guy like people like Debussy and um you know just John Williams had the neoclassical thing and put that into the music so it was that investigation because uh there was just a lot of things that were going on that I felt like was leading me and, and my you know my friend Brett into this production company and we just decided to just kind of jump into the fire, see what happens, kind of try to emulate and make some of this stuff. And as that went on, I started to, you know, take more of the responsibility of, well, if we're going to do this sort of thing, I, I really want to get educated, like, you know, um, and, and revisit like, you know, the, the theory and um, dive back and break open the books of what I studied in school and, and take that even further. So, you know, every day while I was on tour, like I just had stacks of, you know, theory books, like the Samuel Adler, like orchestration books and, you know, like the, the big thick book of like, okay, we're going to go through like all the, the modes and all the Berkeley books. And I would just consume all this stuff and, and just sit there and, 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 and learn it, you know, and analyze you know, Roman numeral, numeral analysis of the chord structures for everything. And, you know, just like really, really dove into it. And then, you know, would write on the road. And even at that time too, we, what we did is eventually we got pretty organized, you know, Brett and I, and we developed like, you know, systems to where, okay, we're going to work in Cubase and I'm going to work in Cubase. And so that way I can send you everything and you will be able to open it up and, you know, you'll be able to add to it and you can send it back to me and then I'll write. And, and that's how we worked while I was on the road. And then, you know, when I'd come home for, you know, from the road for like a week, I would just, as soon as we got home, I just drive to like his place and we would just work on stuff. And that's, we felt like little kids. I mean, we were like middle-aged 30 year old men that were like, <laughs> just like in this room, like all oh, hunkered down, like, Oh yeah. Like, this is cool. I feel like I'm, you know, starting a band again when, you know, I'm like 15 <laughs> starting a band, it was, it was great, but it, and it was different. And from there, certain things just started happening. Like um, a connection that we had both made through a friend. He actually worked in Hollywood. Uh, this guy, Gary Nadeau, he worked on, he was a screenwriter and he did some of the writing, I, I believe for a movie with Robin Williams called Jack and um, he started going off into doing more like, you know, um, like corporate, the like corporate, not movies, but more corporate commercial type of stuff. And, you know, he, he was just like a, a very well-connected guy. And we like hit it off with him and <clears throat> certain people that Brett had, you know, knew for friends of friends. And we just, you know, it would just be like, oh, you know, the, the I don't know, the, the guy who was scoring this movie, uh, there was a movie called Kelly and Cow with Juliette Lewis and the, um, the director and producer, I guess, I don't know, it was, it was like a bad snowstorm or something like that. And, and they were just like, yeah, the, you know, we need to finish these scenes or we need somebody to edit these scenes, you know, and we were like, we'll, we'll just drive in. I don't care. And we were like driving, you know, it was like a foot of snow on the ground, like just driving <laughs> into New York to, to edit the scenes. Cause we just wanted to do it so bad. And then that turned into, you know, um, we need to do a couple more things like, you know, music wise for this. So come to like star Trek, like studios in, in the city, like tomorrow, you know, that's kind of how all this stuff happened. And then the commercials that was all happening, you know, simultaneously. Um, again, it was just, we were working for a company called Layer, and Gary was like part of that. So he, it was like gigs coming from there. You know, we would be like writing, I don't know, like um, like Cajun songs. And then, you know, my uh, buddy Ray, who I, you know, had a great connection with, and 
he was just like, you know, I'm doing like these Google gigs. Can you do something like kind of like Django Reinhardt? Um, I don't know, like, you know, we were tracking a band at the same time. So it was just like all these things like kind of happening. And, um, you know, we had, we had to learn it like on the fly, but we were enjoying, we were like, we were like loving it. So, you know, it's, it's been a lot. I mean, there have been a lot of commercials, um, a handful of movies. Yeah. Like Kelly and Cal was one. And uh, we did, you know, like an independent movie called um, the longest swim, um, a lot of post stuff, you know, like the post stuff is, you know, I've done for, for Dell, um, Honda, uh, the most recent one, I'm trying to think Pfizer, but, um, I love it. I really love it because it just feels like that there's something new every time that's kind of, that's kind of coming down the pipe that I, I have like no clue what I'm doing. I get like really <laughs> nervous about it and I like, you know, requires a lot of, like you said, like, you know, it's a lot of preparing, like just dialing. Okay. Like, well, what I'm going to check out on YouTube or who am I going to talk to that's done this? And, you know, can I get any feedback and what kind of resources can I pull to get as prepared as possible? So yeah, that, you know, when it goes into those gigs, if it's not too last minute, cause sometimes it's just like, do you want this gig? It's Monday. We need it by Wednesday. And it's just the free for all, you know? <laughs> um, but you know, the great thing about that is I think it definitely brings out like the best in you, you know, cause you're, I, I I think I work good under, under time limits sometimes for those types of things. So yeah, just hoarding as much information and talking to as many people as possible that, you know, have like in my little network really helps. Sounds like your musical education just continued on after Berkeley, <laughs> even till till now. You're still learning and figuring it out, like we all are. Yeah, I th- thank I th- you for th- sharing that. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I think it's I think that's like super important. I think just just anything in life too, you know. I just try to learn, like trying to learn, like every day, like as much as you can, you know. Because there's it's especially now, like I said at the beginning, there's so much like that's available you know, like to everybody, there's so much. So it would be like, it kind of be ridiculous not to take advantage of it. Absolutely. Are there more opportunities in a musical career behind the scenes that musicians aren't seeing? Yeah, I definitely think there are. I think I'm living proof of that. I feel like everything is, was moving that way anyway. Um, And I think now more than ever, it's definitely moving that way because just the technology has become so good. And I feel like there are so many opportunities, you know, I think the best way to to get yourself into that again is, you know, if you want to throw yourself to the fire, make cold calls, call, you know, cold call the company, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's tons of opportunities. It's just, you know, like, um, you know, besides doing that, I I did like a lot of stuff where I wrote uh, music for uh, like premium beat and Shutterstock, you know, where, they would just tell you kind of like the format of like how they want you to, you know, write. Can you just write, you know, like a corporate vibe or a cinematic vibe and you, you just do it, you know? And and the worst thing that you could do, you know, is that they, they reject it, you know, but eventually you kind of learn the format and what they tell you to do. And then, you know, you can still bridge the gap of, 
developing your craft of what you know you want to say and what you want to do but also adhering to like their format and and you can keep pushing both and that's exciting that's really cool and i just feel it's something that i had no idea was going to happen on all these other levels getting into it i guess 12 or 13 years ago i just kind of thought like yeah like you know my my friend and i are, are really into like the Batman Dark Knight Rises and Dark Knight soundtrack or whatever and Nine Inch Nails and electronic stuff. And I went to school for that. And maybe it'd be cool to like score a movie, like in our wildest dreams, you know, we could do something like that. Um, now at this point, I just look back and I was just like, wow, I, I never expected that to happen. No way. Like, you know, and, and um, I'm very happy and, and I'm proud of that. And you're killing it. <laughs> no Congratulations, more. Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just keep keep working. Keep working. Takes. Takes. I think this is a great time for our ins and out takes, which is a rapid fire of random questions. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, what is one of the most memorable collaborations you've been a part of? I think... Probably one of the most memorable was um, working with Mike Patton. Oh, my gosh. Tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike Patton, you know, he was mm -hmm. for Faith No More, and, and he had a, a whole bunch of other bands, and he had a label, and it, it's he is, I, I mean, I feel like he is, like, definitely the embodiment of somebody that wears a lot of different hats, and he does it great, and he's successful, and, and a great person. So basically you know, he personally liked the band and asked us to open up for Mr. Bungle, which was in uh, 1999, I believe it was. And we didn't, we weren't received well at, 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 at those shows. People, people hated us. A lot of people hated us. We had garbage cans thrown at us. People oh my goodness. Us, don't give you up your day job. You guys suck, you know, all that stuff. Basically, when we were done with that tour in 99, he basically said like, you know, if you guys ever want to collaborate on something, um, the door is always open. And so, um, you know, we kind of both were kind of doing our own things, but he would show up at a show occasionally and like, you know, hop on stage with us. And that was amazing. And then like um, from there, a couple years later, we were like in between singers and um, we were looking for somebody before we found Greg. And in between all of that, um, we had a couple of songs written and we hit up Patton and Patton was just like, yeah, like I'll definitely do it. And he, he was on tour with Phantomus, I believe at the time and, and another band called Tomahawk. He was just super busy. I remember like he was just constantly doing things and he's just like, I get like a break right here in this like window of time. I have like five days to basically, you know, knock all the vocals out. Some of it, like I'll do at home. And, and he also did like a lot of synths and samples and he just showed up you know, in New Jersey and basically like just dropped all this stuff like in the Pro Tools. And then like just he went nonstop around wow. the clock for four days, like just singing all the music. And he didn't stop. It was crazy. Like I, I couldn't believe it. Like the guy was like a machine and he brought <laughs> where he'd see like microphones and you know, like a gas mask with a microphone in it and like a CB and a bunch of different modded out microphones. Like and I couldn't believe it because he basically printed everything to track to the track. I mean, in, in nowadays, like especially nowadays, it's just kind of like, yeah, record it with the, the, the verb plug in. Uh, we'll fix it later and, and, mm -hmm. and tweak it later. He had everything like committed right there, like all the reverbs dialed in. Like he had this, you know, table full of effects and wow, just like. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, like, let's record it. So, Dream bad mate, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I was just like, oh, wow, this is, this is, this is amazing. This, this is like the ultimate, like, craftsman, you know, like, wow. master craft. So that, that for me, I think touring with them and then doing, the, you know, like, just witnessing the sessions. And I just remember, like, anytime he would be on the stage and, and 
you know, look, the Dillinger guys already brought a very high, commanded a high level of, you know, um, a musicianship, of craftsmanship. And then when he got on there, you're adding that to the mix. It's, it just felt so laser focused, you know, um, just playing with him and, um, uh, you know, also just observing everybody else in the band that, you know, when, when we were playing those songs with him, you know, like, but it's like having a great time, you know, it's just like living out kind of like your, your childhood fantasies. Cause I, Faith No More was a, a huge influence for me growing up as a kid, you know? So yeah, that's massive, massive, memorable experience. Wow. If you weren't, well, if you didn't have a career in music, what's another career you would have liked to explore? I think, I think video. <laughs> Makes <laughs> anything, sense. <laughs> anything art related, especially now, like I've, I've taken a lot of uh, interest in, and I'm, I'm, I'm learning about, you know, CG and, and animation, working with programs like uh, 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 Cinema 4D and, and programs like Nuke and, um, you know, doing compositing and, and all that stuff. There's that, that world is really, really deep. And again, now the tools like are available you know, and so I, I'm finding that really, really fascinating. It's, it just kind of hit me like you know, a year ago and I was like, oh, wow, like, let's try this. Like, let's see what happens with this, you know? And so, yeah, for the past, like, I'd say year and a half or so, I've been like really diving into that too. So awesome. If you could drum for any band or artist that isn't metal, <laughs> who would that be? Oh, um, I think any artist, I guess, I don't know, I would say like Hans Zimmer, because Hans Zimmer, he went and did like some shows, um, you know, pre-pandemic and he played Coachella. You know, I feel like in film scoring, my personal favorites are John Williams and, and uh, Hans Zimmer. And Hans has always done, uh, you know, I mean, dating back to, you know, doing things like... Um, Oh God, what did he do? Like back in the, in the eighties, like movies, like the power of one. And they, they were drastically different than what he's done now. Um, but he keeps evolving. I think he's like the embodiment of, 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 of evolving. And, you know, recently he just, he just did a uh, Dune, you know, the Dune soundtrack. Wow. And, yeah. And, and so I've always been into it, but like the past, like 10 years now, He's like kind of reined everybody in and, and he's like kind of like, now I have everybody's attention and he's managed to, to keep that, you know, like to really stay like at, at, at the top of the mountain. I, I feel like that's like the hardest thing to do, you know? So yeah, he, I know a couple of years ago, before, pre-pandemic, he, he basically took the band that he had, a bunch of people that he had and brought them out and he basically replicated those you know, amazing soundtrack songs that, you know, that, that he has with, with a ton of people. So if I could ever be a part of that, that would be amazing. You know, <laughs> that would really be amazing. That would, that would be, that would be wild. Yes. We're manifesting it by saying it. <laughs> you will do it. You it will play with just, him. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> Chris, what's better being a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? Oh yeah, being a small fish in a big pond. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. I I don't like the um the fact of being uh, the, the the being the you know the big fish. I, I mean, look, I was fortunate enough to kind of be in some high profile uh, bands. I guess I don't know what work from them, and I jumped into you know Coheed, and that was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. You know, and I'm very thankful for that. But um. I really do have to say that I feel like being at the, the bottom and, and not like, I don't know. I feel like big fish sometimes can lead to complacency. Little fish, it's like you got to keep moving to get away from the big fish. And like, you know, you're, you're, you're maneuvering, you're, you're, you're working through things, you know, and you're, you're constantly, you know, on the lookout and constantly looking for maybe other opportunities or you're looking for, other things that kind of keep you humble and kind of keep you, you know, keep you learning, keep you moving forward. I, to me, I, I think little fish. 
That's a great answer. Last but not least, who would play you in the movie of your life? <laughs> uh, oh, man. <laughs> um, I don't in my in my my wildest dreams, if I if I yeah anyone up if I bulked up and lifted tons of weights, it would have to be the Rock, <laughs> Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Come on, it's so great, That's awesome. I love that guy. That guy is like my favorite. It's amazing. He's hilarious, and he's just as versatile as you are. So I think that would work well. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, um, you're making a new Return to Earth album. Let's talk about that. Sure, sure. Yeah, so Return to Earth is um, basically Brett, who was my partner and my one of my best friends, and Ronnie, I met him when I was doing a session for Brett's band, and we all just kind of clicked. And while we were kind of doing our other bands, we kind of formed Return to Earth just to kind of do some things. I think, you know, really before Brett and I had the production company, we just wanted to try and like mess around and do recording like on our own. And so basically um, we created two records, one which uh, was released on Ronnie has a label. And then the second one we did was released on a partnership with Ronnie and metal blade. And we, we basically, kind of did that as a precursor to the production company because we wanted to just try it here. Here's all the gear that we just bought. Like, let's use it. There was really no limit to that. And that's what the, the really the start to getting into everything that followed, you know, with the company, with Brett and I and Ronnie and, and, you know, just me taking another path and leading to where it is now. So, I guess that was 2000. Yeah, that was like 2008 when we made it. 2009, it was released. And then we started writing like other tunes. And then life basically just kind of got in the way. Like, uh, you know, Brett had a baby and um, we were doing the production company and, and Ronnie was working on other things, had other things going on. He was working at, at Z100. And then it was like a year ago. Yeah, it was about a year ago. And he's just like, dude, let's do like another return to earth record. And I was like, <laughs> all right, that's going to be quite an undertaking because the last one was quite an undertaking that we did. And um, I said, look, like, you know, we're scattered about the, you know, the country. Ronnie, I think at the time was living like in Maryland and, you know, the pandemic had happened, you know, and, and all this stuff. And, we knew we weren't going to be able to get together. It wasn't possible. So what I, you know, I told them, I said, look, like, you know, I'm kind of moving and I have been moving and, and you know, we're in a different role and everybody's in a different place in their lives. And, you know, everything that's going on now is, it's just different from 10 years ago. And I really want to like, you know, I want to really want to try my hand at like resurrecting like some of the songs that we had because we just kind of kind of put it together and then we kind of like let it sit and, and there wasn't anything really happening like there at the end. And, and I feel like, you know, they were tucked away like on a hard drive somewhere. So basically like we just resurrected the stuff and it was like, it's, it, you know, it sounds great. Like, <laughs> let me try, you know, something that like I, I haven't really done a lot of and, and that's mixing and, and, you know, trying to do that sort of thing. And it just kind of, you know, gained a little momentum where Ronnie and Brett were writing things and contributing things. And then we started to go a little bit more, you know, electronic because that was kind of the realm that, you know, that, that kind of dictated things. And I feel like that's where our headspace was. So this record, which is called uh, Oblivion, um, it's, it's kind of like a mix of uh, some electronic elements and some of the songs that we did 10 years ago kind of resurrected and then threw some more contemporary modern elements on top of it. And we took our time with it. Um, this wasn't something, it was a passion project. It wasn't something that obviously we're not, you know, um, trying to put it on a label we're not, you know, I mean, if somebody picked it up, that would be, that would be great. If not, it's no big deal. Like, it's just for us, 
we enjoy making music. We enjoy the process. And it was cool to kind of just see it like all to come together. It was, it was slow, but that evolution of it was exciting. And again, it was it just, let me just jump into the fire. Let's just do this. And, um, and yeah, basically we just, you know, came out on the other end of, you know, a collection of songs that I feel when I listen back to it, like, I think we're all very proud of it. You know, I feel, always feel like writing records are a good documentation or, you know, uh, of what you're doing or what you're going through at that time. It, it just reflects it. And I, and I think, I think that record does that. I think it's good. Where can people find the release or do you have a physical release as well available? The physical release is not out yet. It, it will be out okay. in, uh, in, in another year, actually. Okay. Um, we still like a lot of things that we kind of need to put together and, and, uh, we're doing like, you know, vinyl test presses and stuff like that too. So also you have a book. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I did a book. It's, it's, it's a drumming book. It's called polyrhythmic potential. You can go on Amazon and get it. Um, I worked, uh, in, in partnership with, uh, Joe, uh, Bergamini and Joe's great. Joe's a great educator. Um, he does, uh, he does a ton of stuff for Hudson. And, and basically he approached me a while ago, a long, this is a long time ago, um, about basically trying to <laughs> note, notate out like some of the Dillinger songs um, on like drum notation. And so basically what's in that book is, yeah, you'll, you'll find notation, um, you know, drum notation on some of the Dillinger songs, but you also kind of find a little bit of like the philosophy so it's a, it's like a, a two part book. It's basically the first part is um, the methods and, and, you know, the exercises and some of the listening exercises. And then the second half is, is the notation of some of the songs. And you have a lot of fans who like pretty much worship that book. I'm sure, you know, <laughs> when I was just kind of, you know, looking at, at, at other older videos and stuff, people were like, have you seen his book? Oh my gosh. It's like, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. If people listen to it or people, you know, say something like, you know, hey, I, you know, I, I, I bought the book and it's been a great, you know, uh, tool in, in developing what I'm trying to achieve. That's, that's, that's great. Like, that's really, really great. It's pretty, pretty mind blowing. I never <laughs> thought that would happen, you know. Before I forget, who do you think we should have on the podcast next? <sighs> okay. How about <laughs> Ludwig Göransson? Do you know who Ludwig Göransson is? No, I don't. Who's that? He is a composer that worked on uh, the Black Panther soundtrack. Okay. And just recently worked on Tenet. And I, I just, I think he's like fabulous. I just, I like the, the, the vibe of the, um, uh, you know, uh, of the soundtracks. And I, and I think his, um, you, the, the, you know, the movies that he's working with are great. I really think he's kind of like the next guy. So yeah, I mean, that would be somebody I would love to, to hear about. Yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations on everything in your amazing career and what you keep Thank on you. doing. Thank you so much for your time today, Chris. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been such a pleasure. Once again, I'm Jamie Hernandez, and this is The Ins and Outs with Mackie, a show about awesome gear and awesome people. We'll be bringing musicians, engineers, podcasters, streamers, and sometimes the occasional Macoid. If you're new to the show, make sure to hit that subscribe button on your favorite platform to get all the latest Mackie updates as soon as they are out. And be sure to check the description on how you can win a free microphone. Until next time, Macoids. I think video.